Good afternoon. Well, good morning to most of you, but good afternoon uh, from New Zealand. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, uh, the Honourable Mercy Christy Barenz, MP from Indonesia, who's the chair of the Green Economy Caucus and a board member of Air Quality Asia to uh, welcome us this afternoon. She is a member of the House of Representatives and is chair of the Green Economy Caucus. She's also a member of Commission 7, the Energy and Mineral Resources Research and Technology and Environment Commission. Mercy, the floor is yours. Yeah. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, on behalf of Green Economy Caucus of Parliaments of Indonesia and Air Quality Asia of Indonesia Group, allow me to give my warmest welcome to all of you. Although in the pandemic of COVID-19, we still work from home, but our willingness and spirit are maintained to do many things useful. So let me express my welcome here to Ms. Azia Rafi, President of AQA, Honorable Harry Duinhofen, former Transport and Energy Minister of New Zealand, also as Secretary of AQA and Regional Coordinator, Honorable Matthew J. Nolan, Treasurer of AQA, his Excellency, Mr. Kurt Kunz, Ambassador of Switzerland to Indonesia. It's an honor for us to have you here. Mr. Barlef Niko Marhehe, Chief of Mission, UNAP of Indonesia. Honorable Dr. Dewi Aryani, MP of Indonesia, and today she is our keynote speaker. We have another two eminent speakers, Ms. Budi Susili Rani, Director of Pure Earth, and Ms. Bovia Whitney from local NGO in Kalimantan, Tambu Sinta Foundations, my Velo MPs, Honorable Diabaro Esti, also as Secretary of Green Economy Caucus, Honorable Budi Satrio Juandono, Honorable Sartono Hutomo, Honorable Davy Carno, Honorable Ratna Juita, and all distinguished participants. I would like to say thank you for all of you for all of your presence here and express my sincerest gratitude for this excellent and inclusive collaborations to make this webinar happen today. Through fully support and fund from US Asia Institute to facilitate this event, I, would I also would like to say thank you. Today, our webinar will be running ahead with the main title of rising awareness towards pollution and its impact to human health. I am I'm sure that we all can share knowledge, skill, and many best practices and good lessons learned on this issue. So through the presentation and QA sessions by the end of this webinar, we can craft the recommendation or conclusion to tackling the hazardous pollution's impact to human health. Nowadays, in pandemic COVID-19, even the fresh air is very important for everybody on the earth. With this opportunity, I would like to give brief information about the Green Economy Caucus of Parliaments of Indonesia and its role regarding the environmental issue, equality and justice of ecology and development issue. Green Economy Caucus have been delivered strategic contributions and influence in the process of policy making in Parliaments of Indonesia which green-based perspective and analysis to strengthen the awareness and perspective of the parliament function through green-based legislation, green budgeting, and green-based oversight of implementation on the ground with local carbon-based policy of development. Established since 2009, an honorable Mr. Satya Virayuda in that time was the chairman of Green Economic Caucus till 2019, so in two terms in parliament. One of the best of the caucus achievements was that all members of the caucus had fully involved in Commission 7 in accelerating to ratify the United Nations Framework Conventions on Climate Change, a Paris Agreement into the national law and declared officially to be the law of Paris Agreement number 16, 2016. It shows that governments and parliaments of Indonesia had committed to decrease carbon emissions systematically, which focus in five sectors. Those are energy, industry, forestry, agriculture, and waste management. We stated officially in document of national determined contributions and the 
with the target to decrease the carbon emission to 29% by the national level and 41% by the international or global assistance in 2030. So I can say that Paris agreements and law number 16, 2016 had given the wider space for the policymaker and related multi-stakeholders in Indonesia to take actions and role to achieve the NDC targets. It also gives mandatory to increase and strengthening the accountability, transparency, and substantive participation. However, Green Economy Caucus noted that there are some weaknesses in implementations of the policy which related to the funding issues, technology, human resources, how to verify the national policy to the sub-national level, engage the state and non-state actors inclusively, and how to strengthen the law enforcement in action. Now, this is our third term of Green Economy Caucus to continue our mission and the parliaments of Indonesia. I and the Aurora SP as, as the chair and secretary and all members of Green Economy Caucus keep work together and participate actively with green-based policy making onwards in the parliaments. Therefore, it's an honor for Green Economy Caucus today to work together with AQA and US Asia Institute to hold such a webinar on the pollution and its impact to human health as part of the NDC action. I also believe that this webinar will be running fruitful in the coming hours. Again, welcome for all of you in the webinar and thank you very much. Your yes. Excellencies, Honorable Members of Parliament, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Air Quality Asia, I would like to thank you all for taking time in your busy schedules to discuss the issue of pollution and its impacts on human health. Air Quality Asia is an international parliamentary advocacy group focusing on a breathable future for Asia. Since 2016, AQA has been working with high level policy makers to implement the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 2030 and the Paris Agreement by helping governments in Indonesia, India and Pakistan and other parts of Asia to strengthen national environment and energy policies. Today, Air Quality Asia is represented by myself as Secretary of AQA, Salzi al Rafi, President and Convener, who will present on the UN SDGs, particularly SDG 12.4, and Matthew J. Nolan, Treasurer, who will deliver the vote of thanks. We are witnessing an unprecedented time in a series of global challenges due to COVID-19 pandemic and exacerbations of climate change. Nearly 1 million lives have been lost already. As tragic as the current outbreak is, there is another silent killer that continues to claim lives daily around the world, and that is pollution. According to the World Health Organization, pollution kills 8.9 million people every year with limited response from governments around the world. There is evidence that the COVID-19 pandemic has worsened because of pollution. Scientists have also suggested that air pollution particles may be acting as vehicles for viral transmission. So we must clean up our land, water and air across the globe and our decision makers at all levels, national, subnational, and metropolitan they need to adopt policies for cleaner air and soil as a priority. We hope that this meeting will open that new chapter in Indonesia. Now, I would like to give the floor to our distinguished guest, His Excellency Mr. Kurt Kunz, Ambassador of Switzerland to Indonesia. Previously, Mr. Kunz served as Ambassador of Switzerland to Colombia. Ambassador Kunz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, dear. Honorable Mercy Barons, mem uh, Member of Parliament, uh, Indonesian Board Member of AQA and Chair of Green Economy Caucus, uh, dear Honorable Daya Rora Esti Vidya Putri, Member of Parliament, uh, Secretary, Green Economy Caucus, dear Honorable Dr. Devi Ariani, Member of Parliament, uh, Sec um, Commissioner, uh, nine on health, dear Mrs. Shasia uh, Rafi, President and Convener uh, of uh, AQA, dear Honorable Harry uh, Doyne Hoven, Secretary, AQA New Zealand, uh, dear Honorable Matthew Nolan, Treasurer of uh, AQA from I Ireland, dear uh, friends, 
It is really a special opportunity to meet this morning. For us, it's still morning here in Jakarta from all around uh, the, the globe on this very, very crucial uh, topic. Well, as you have been men mentioning, uh, Mr. Harry uh, Doinhoven, pollution is a major global challenge that touches all of us. And while we are rightly preoccupied uh, at the moment with the unprecedented challenges brought to our societies by COVID-19, it is important not to lose sight of the other urgent challenges we face. And pollution is certainly one of them. Switzerland has a long history with pollution control. Uh, we have made considerable progress over the last decades in reducing air, water, and soil pollution. For example, our emissions of black co carbon have decreased by around 70% between 2000 and 2018. So uh, progress uh, is, is possible, it is doable, uh, but because Pollution is a global challenge and knows no borders. International cooperation to address pollution is critical. Switzerland is actively engaged internationally. One of our longest standing engagements in this field is with the UNECE Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution, signed in Geneva in 1979 that brings together over 50 signatories from North America, Europe, and Central Asia. The convention has established a forum for international cooperation in December 2019 and is ready to share its long experience with other regions of the world. Let me also highlight two of the global alliances we support to make faster progress to together in tackling pollution by sharing best practices, expertise, and lessons learned by different countries in addressing these challenges. The Global Alliance on Health Pollution is established in Geneva at the heart of international efforts to address issues related to chemicals and waste, as well as global health, with Geneva hosting the secretariats of the Basel, of the Rotterdam, of the Stockholm and of the Minamata Conventions and the World Health Organization. Switzerland is proud to support Global Alliance on Health and Pollution, which also assists countries in finding effective solutions to tackling the specific pollution challenges safe faith through health and pollution action plans. And we welcome the cooperation with Indonesia in Kalimantan that we will hear more about from GHHP partners in this event. I'm looking forward to it. Switzerland also supports the Climate and Clean Air Coalition that brings together 70 states, state partners, and over 80 international institutions and other uh, non-state entities who work uh, collectively to reduce emissions of short-lived climate pollutants that are sourced from agriculture and forest fires to vehicles and waste burning. Reducing their emission brings multiple benefits for air quality and health, for food security and the climate at the regional, national and local levels. The Co Climate and Clean Air Coalition helps find the most effective solutions for reducing these emissions in each sector. Together with the United Nations Environment Program, the Cl Climate and Clean Air Coalition published a report on air pollution in Asia and the Pacific in uh, 2019 that identified 25 clean air measures that together could help 1 billion people breathe cleaner air by 2030 and reduce global warming by a third of a degree Celsius by 2050. Um, 
the findings were discussed at the ASEAN Ministerial and High Level Workshop on Health, Air Pollution and Climate Change organized in June 2019 by the Philippines, ASEAN, and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. Switzerland is proud to currently be co-chairing this coalition together with Ghana, and we would welcome Indonesia joining this coalition. Tackling pollution and achieving sustainable development go hand in hand. And we are convinced that by sharing experiences and solutions in alliances, we can accelerate our collective efforts to protect the health of people and of the planet. Thank you again for this invitation. I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Kuntz. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Mr. Balev Niko Mahehe, Chief of Mission UNEP Indonesia. Mr. Mahehe is current UNEP head in Indonesia, and prior to this, he was Senior Program Officer Asian Development Bank and has worked with the ASEAN Secretariat. Uh, Balev, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Mercy Christy Barons, Chair of Green Economic Caucus. Honorable Dewi Ariani, Commission 9, House of Representatives. Honorable Member of House of Representatives. Honorable Eri Dewinhoven, former Transport and Energy Minister, New Zealand, now Secretary AKA. His Excellency, Mr. Kurt Kunz, Ambassador of Switzerland to Indonesia. Ms. Sajia Razi, President Air Quality Asia. Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Firstly, I would like to congratulate Green Caucus Economy and Air Quality Asia for organizing today's webinar on raising awareness towards pollution and its impact to human health. It's an honor for UN Environment Program to be invited to this webinar. Today's webinar is timely as we just celebrated for the first time the International Day of Clean Air for Blue Skies on 7 September 2020. The celebration underlines pollution as a global issue which requires global cooperation for successful response. Ladies and gentlemen, we are coming together at a critical time. Our region is not on track to achieve any of the sustainable development goals by 2030. 92% of people living in Asia are exposed to unhealthy levels of air quality. We have experienced the severe episodes of air pollution, especially in Southeast Asia. Forest fire and wildfires are affecting many countries in the region, including Australia, Myanmar, Thailand, and Indonesia. These fires are expected to increase in likelihood and severity due to climate change. Rising temperatures increase frequency of wildfires, which in turn further elevate levels of air pollution. The latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change re report warns us that we have just 12 years left to prevent dangerous levels of climate change. Unfortunately, the current ambition to address climate change is not enough to keep temperatures rise well below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Nature is declining globally at unprecedented rates. One million plant and animal species are threatened with extinction. Unfortunately, the current global response is insufficient. The COVID-19 pandemic reminded us of the intimate connection between the health of people and the health of our planet. Habitat destruction and deforestation, uncontrolled expansion of agriculture and infrastructure development contribute to the transfer of disease from wildlife to people. Another key observations during COVID-19 is the increased consumption of single-use products, such as single-use gloves, masks, disinfection wipes, and tissues. This may also extend to other aspects of a fast adapting lifestyle, such as switching back to using single-use shopping bags, packaging from delivery of foods and household goods. If improperly disposed of, this will increase the amount of plastic waste generated and potentially pollute land and marine environment. All this comes at a great cost. 
according to the Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, the cost of pollution in low and middle income countries amount to 2% of gross domestic product and up to 7% of annual spending in terms of healthcare costs. The social and economic cost of inaction greatly exceeds the cost of actions to address pollution. To get us back on track, transformative changes are required through integrated policies aimed at a system-wide approach such as food and energy rather than individual issues. One of the examples of an integrated approach is the air pollution in Asia and the Pacific Science-Based Solution Report, which we launched in 2018 at the WSO First Global Conference on Air Pollution and Health. This report identifies 25 clean air measures that will deliver health and environment benefits in our region. We are collecting information on the progress of these 25 clean air measures and we welcome partners to help us take this forward. One of the 25 clean air measures identified is promotion of electric mobility. UNEP has been facilitating sector transformation to electric mobility through support for developing standards, regulations, and business models to promote use of e vehicles in India, Indonesia, Maldives, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. UNEP is supporting governor's office in piloting electric buses in Jakarta. UNEP is working to mobilize resources to support the governor's office and TransJakarta in developing policies, business and operational plan, integrating renewable energy, procurement policy, and bid documents for acquiring e-buses. These integrated approaches can only be realized through multi-stakeholder partnerships. One of the key platforms which bring environment and health sector together is the Asia Pacific Regional Forum on Health and Environment. This platform provides a unique avenue for the health and environment ministers of 51 countries and territories to come together and collectively identify and address health and environment issues that require international action and to facilitate dialogue and exchange knowledge to promote sustainable development. The Governor of Indonesia, through its Ministry of Health and Ministry of Environment and Forestry, is the new chair of the regional forum. UNEP, together with the World Health Organization, is supporting Indonesia in its chairship focus on the role of strategic health and environment on national development to achieve the sustainable development goals. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, President Joko Widodo, in his address to the United States General Assembly recently, called for stronger collaboration to tackle global challenges. President Joko Widodo underlined the importance of working together to create a better world. I would like to echo President Joko Widodo's message. Let us work together to demonstrate how concerted and decisive action from both health and environment sector will move the region closer to achieving SDG. Thank you very much. I wish you a successful webinar. Thank you, Nico. I'd now like to welcome the Honorable Dr. Dewey Arayani, MP from Indonesia, former chair of AQA Indonesia Group, member of Commission 9, presenting on the health impact of pollution. We welcome you. You are also vice chairman of the Committee for Petroleum and Gasoline of the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce. Dr. Arayani, welcome. The floor is yours. Honorable Dr. Ayani, thank you very much for a thorough presentation. I'm only sorry, Dewey, that the uh, sound quality was poor, but your visuals were very, very good. Thank you. Uh, can I now introduce Ms. Shazi Arafi, President of AQA. She's the President and Convener of Air Quality Asia and former Secretary General of Parliamentarians for Global Action from 1996 to 2013. Ms. Rafi led the Parliamentary Working Group on Clean Air 2014-15. Shazia, welcome. 
Thank you, Harry, and thank you, everybody. Um, Honorable Mercy Barenz, Honorable Dr. D.V. Ariani, Honorable Dia Roro S.T. Vidyaputri, Honorable Members of the House of Representatives of Indonesia, Ambassador Kunz, colleagues from the United Nations, the World Bank and Civil Society, ladies and gentlemen, Salamat Pagi and good morning. Air Quality Asia is grateful to the Green Economy Caucus for your critical leadership on clean air. Allow me to share the role that parliamentarians played in the global agreements on clean air and how the continuing work of Air Quality Asia Indonesia fits into this global framework. Air pollution is an accelerator of climate change. The same carbon emissions that speed up global warming make air quality worse. Air quality monitoring allows policymakers like you a real-time progress measure on climate change as well. The right to clean air was proposed at the Interparliamentary Union meeting November 2013 by the Parliamentary Working Group on Clean Air. Clean air language was negotiated in the SDGs 2030 by September 2015 with strong targets and signed by all governments. Three clean air SDG 2030 targets um, are important. They are specific. They lay out the sources of air pollution with the implementation to be undertaken by governments. Um, they are, um, the UN system, UN agencies, WHO, UNEP, Habitat are all assigned uh, a monitoring role. The World Bank, Asian Development Bank are among the affiliated agencies to fund this imp implementation as are various OECD donors. 2020 was meant to be the implementation year for SDG 12.4, uh, which covers drastic reductions for chemical contamination. At the key working group session on 12.4, which was co-chaired by UNEP and Pure Earth in 2015, Pure Earth pushed for inclusion of soil and water. The Parliamentary Working Group on Clean Air pushed for the inclusion of air and air quality. Success in getting all three of these, air, soil, and water, into the target was the crucial first step. However, the second step of implementation is much harder. The clearest example of the implementation challenge we face is the delay in meeting target SDG 12.4. We're clearly not meeting it in 2020 and not, not due to COVID. Even prior to COVID-19, the UN Statistical Division had downgraded the key indicators for SDG 12.4 to tier three, which means there is no established methodology for measuring the indicator. This, however, is not necessarily true as established methods of measuring chemicals released into the air are in use in major carbon emitting economies. What is true is that governments face hurdles, both economic and political in implementation. To understand the scale of the challenge, let us look at pollution cleanup examples from the Americas. In 1975, when I first came to the United States as a young student, I landed in New York City, a smog-filled urban scape where you could not see the tops of buildings and where it was difficult to breathe. It took 30 years of rigorous enforcement of the Clean Air Act to restore blue skies over Manhattan. I then went on to my college, Bryn Mawr College, named after a coal mining town in Wales from which coal miners were brought to Pennsylvania. A devastated hell is what they left behind. It took decades to restore the soil and vegetation to what is now a green oasis. Today, we don't have decades as pollution is destroying our health and our economies and the resulting climate change is pressing upon us. There are wildfires from Siberia to California. Cities face even more pressure due to density. Jakarta often ranks within the top 10 cities where the highest air pollution. In addition to health impact is the cost of air pollution to our economies. The World Bank 2016 report based on 2013 base data, which hasn't been updated since, Indonesia had a 5.6% negative GDP impact. 
For comparison, the same year, India's negative GDP impact was 7.8%. These are huge amounts of money. As air pollution levels have increased, so has the cost to the economy. This money is literally leaking out of the economy due to air pollution. Globally, it was about 5.3 trillion in 2016. I often hear that it's impossible. It will take decades to reduce air pollution. But that's not true. Within weeks of the COVID-19 lockdown, we see air pollution had dropped dramatically across the globe. And in Jakarta, blue skies had returned. But of course, we can't permanently shut down the economy. And as you can see, if policies are not changed, pollution returns. After COVID, we must and can build back better. We know from data from the US, Europe, Mexico, Chile, China, which is, you know, we don't have the time to share the data here in this webinar, that air quality improvement policies do work. Chile, for example, has re achieved remarkable results with stronger enforcement within the space of five to 10 years. Indonesia is already on that path with the government commitment for transitioning the economy to a green economy with Commission 7 and the Green Economy Caucus playing a key role. The things that work in addition to air quality monitoring, they need to be targets, timelines, emission standards for power plants, industry, pollutant cleanup mandated and enforced on the mining sector, which is a major sector in Indonesia. Cleaner fuel transport, including moving to electric vehicles, both for public and private vehicles. Bloomberg New Energy Finance estimated in 2017 that the internal combustion engine would be overtaken by electric vehicles by 2038. California governor's executive order yesterday brings that date forward to 2035 in the world's largest car market, which is California. So it is in your hands as the politicians and policymakers to accelerate that date and that transition. This is a clear visual of the soot going into your lungs, depending on which Euro level fuel is currently allowed on your roads. Euro six would be an empty bottle. Legislators are also political leaders on the national and international stage and can build cooperation through your skills as deal makers, communicators, lawmakers, and ultimately enforcers with oversight on government, industry, and international organizations. The key challenge for all our countries is growing our economies while adjusting our industrial lifestyle to preserve the air, water, and soil the earth is blessed with. Terima Kasi, thank you again. Shazia, thank you very much for a very thoughtful presentation. It is now my pleasure to welcome the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution presentation. Uh, first, Ms. Budi Susalorini, the Country Director of Pure Earth in Indonesia since 2008. She has previously worked on a Mercury Project coordination meeting with UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization in Salvador, Brazil. Budi, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you, Harry, for the introduction. Um, Excellencies, Honorable Member of Parliament of the uh, Republic of Indonesia, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera. I'm very um, grateful and honored because uh, given the, the opportunity by um, AQA and also the Green Economic Caucus led by Ibu Melsi to share our lessons learned in uh, action planning on health and pollution in several uh, countries. So GAP or Global Alliance on Health and Pollution aims to reduce death and illness caused by all forms of pollution in water, soil, air, and chemical waste, especially in low and mid middle income countries. And one of the programs that we have been advocating uh, to the countries is the action planning on health and pollution, which is a national or regional pollution prioritization. And it is an action planning process based on impacts health and 
we do the health and pollution action planning by collaborating with the national and subnational government, uh, GAP experts, and also um, other relevant stakeholders. And our objective is to advance the specific recommendations and interventions, which are designed to increase available resources and monitoring um, the progress. So, uh, as also um, cited by Ibu Dewi and also uh, Bapak Marlef, uh, Bapak Barlef, uh, I also refer to the Lancet Commission report on health and pollution, which was published in 2015. That one of the findings that in 2015, the diseases caused by pollution approached 9.6 million deaths, uh, and that counts for 17% of the total deaths in the world. And in low and middle income countries, pollution results in pre premature deaths uh, that is accounted uh, around 92%. And air pollution is the biggest cause of pollution related um, diseases. And as uh, pointed out by Ibu Dewi, that in 2015, approximately 6.4 million uh, caused premature deaths, uh, including 2.8 million. Uh, uh, affected by household air pollution and 4.2 million due to amb ambient air uh, pollution. So, despite uh, severe impacts of pollution on human health, unfortunately, pollution is still underfunded. And one of the main reasons is there is like a lack of data on health and economic impacts. Uh, as Ibu Dewi pointed also that pollution causes uh, various diseases and cause economically. Additionally, pollution causes economic losses by decreasing the quality of ecosystem and destroying the natural system that human needs. The economic costs of pollution are enormous that are not visible because they are associated with hidden damage to organ functions such as decreased level of intelligence uh, of I or, or IQ, especially in children uh, as the vulnerable uh, group, and also cro chronic non-communicable diseases that occur after several years or even several decades after exposure and with loss of uh, natural resources. So with no data, we have no justification for resources. So for that reason, GAP has been actively engaging discussions with countries to make pollution as national priority and also to encourage countries to um, measure the impact data and we also extend um, assistance uh, to measure the impact data so we can mobilize um, resources. So far, GAP has been facilitating health and pollution action planning in several countries, including Madagascar, Colombia, Thailand, and Senegal. And in 2019, uh, we supported uh, the initiative uh, facilitated by Bapak Dalit Bank of Central Kalimantan and also a local community development organization based in area named Yayasan Tamuhak Sinta to develop the health and health and pollution action plan for the province of Central Kalimantan. So without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over the presentation to Ibu Whitney from Yayasan Tambuak Sinta. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rovio Whitney, Program Officer of YTS, Team Lead uh, of the Yayasan Tambuak Foundation working on community development and artisanal small-scale gold mining process. Ms. Whitney has a degree in chemical engineering and is taking the second half of this presentation. Welcome. Good morning, everyone. Excellencies, honorable members of parliament, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Fofia Whitney. I'm a program officer uh, at Yayasan Tambuak Sinta, our Yayasan is a local NGO based in Central uh, in Palangkaraya, Central Kalimantan Province. Our our Yayasan works for years in uh, on the community development and environmental issue in the province and and other province in Indonesia. For saving our precious time, here uh, allow me to deliver my presentation. The title is "Lesson Learned from Central Kalimantan." sharing the result of HPAP Health and Pollution Action Plan. As introduction to the project, 
uh, here's the overview of the project background. Uh, yet YTS have worked in Central Kalimantan province for years. Uh, we have strong uh, uh, commitment and relationship with the local government. We also have strong support from the local community. Together, we consider that there are strong background for us to have the ESPA project in the Central Kalimantan. Some of the reasons related to the topography of the area and other one to the community livelihood. Central Kalimantan has the, the second largest peatland in, in, in Indonesia. The province uh, often face uh, forest and peatland fires. We almost face it uh, every year, especially, especially during the long dry season. On the other hand, type of community, community mine livelihood uh, sometimes associated as the uh, pollutant contribution to, to the environment. Uh, for instance, like ISGM, artisanal small-scale gold mining, uh, widely associated as the mercury pollutant contributor to the environment, uh, while the agriculture and plantation company sometimes suspected as the pesticide, pesticide pollution contributor to the environment. With the strong commitment from the regional government, uh, finally we agreed to have the project uh, in central Kalimantan province. The project ran successfully thanks to the good uh, and strong commitment from different, different actors. The actors come from uh, different key stakeholders. Some uh, are fr uh, from the central Kalimantan province uh, governments. They come from uh, different related agencies and services, while some come from uh, local academics from local university and few come from the local NGO in Palangkaraya. And we also have strong support, intensive guidance from Pure Earth uh, Indonesia Country Office and GASP. The process, the project itself have several stages. The first one we have inception workshop. We have the workshop uh, on March 20. 28, 2019, the participants come from related parties, agree on the several terms. Uh, the participants agree on the three uh, priority pollution. The first one, smoke pollution from the forest and peatland fires, mercury pollution from ASGM sector, artisanal small-scale gold mining sectors, and the, the last pollution is pesticide pollution from agriculture and plantation. The participants also agree to have working forum uh, to develop the action plan for the priority pollution. The, uh, the process will lead by and coordinate by Bapeda Litbang as the government body who in charge on the development program planning in the region. Uh, the second stage is the development of action plan workshop. In order to develop the action plan, we have two working forum. The first one we have on May 23rd, 2019. The, this particular working forum uh, conducted to develop the action plan for smoke pollution from uh, forest and peatland fires. And the second forum we have on July 9, 2019, to discuss to an, an, for another two uh, priority pollution, mercury pollution and pesticide pollution. In the working forums, uh, all the participants from the related key parties uh, sit together and to discuss the proposed activity for action plan to reduce the health impact of each priority pollution. The action plan finalized during the exit meeting workshop. All the participants uh, dis uh, discuss on the, and agree on the proposed activity uh, institution, institution uh, who will in charge to, to coordinate the activities, budget estimation, the future ex challenges or obstacles, and etc. Through long process, the project come with construct constructive result. The project produced three uh, action plan for three priority pollution. The action plan uh, proposed to into three terms the first term is short term for one and two uh, for the, for one and second years and the middle term uh, middle term for 
three to five years, and the long term for six to ten years. The purpose of activity mostly about on how to, how to educate the community, raising their awareness on the health impact of health impacts of the pollution, and also advocate the local government to issue regulation and policy, as well as uh, the working uh, the development program considering the environmental aspect, especially the health and impact of the the pollution. During the project uh, implementation, we faced several challenges. The political dynamic in the region make a frequent transfer in the management level of the services and agency in the region. And it has a strong impact to the government policy and working program. And we also have faced the challenge on the absence of data. We have difficulty to collect data on the pollution, the health and economic impact. We can say that we have zero data during the, during the project implementation. Uh, the third challenge is uh, sectoral isolation and lack of coordination. During the exit uh, meeting workshop, uh, some of the government representatives said that uh, there are still strong uh, sectoral ego and lack of coordination uh, on the government's uh, uh, institution. Uh, and, it, and it often leads to the overlapping and gap during the development uh, implementation in the field. They have a very wide uh, scope of work, uh, a very wide targeted area, and many uh, beneficiary, beneficiary target, uh, targets, while they have lack of uh, funding and human resource. Uh, meanwhile, the government cannot focus on, to, on development, uh, the, uh, considering the, uh, the health and pollution as, uh, aspect, uh, because the, right now the, the government said that they still focus on, on how to uh, improve the welfare of the community. The expected follow-up. Uh, the SPA pro uh, project uh, finished on March 2020. We already hand over the final report, as uh, including the three uh, action plan for for three uh, priority pollution to Bapeda Litbang as the representative of the uh, regional government of Central Kalimantan Province. What's next? As the follow up, the, as the follow up of the project in quarter three to 2020 to quarter one 2021, uh, we will we will disseminate the result of SPAP to national and regional level, in the national like we have today, uh, in, uh, in the webinar, and we will have the re regional parliamentary uh, workshop uh, expect to have on Janu uh, January to 2021. Uh, we will uh, involve uh, legislative and executive and other related key parties during the, the workshop. Uh, the, the, the dissemination of SPAP result aims to, to raising the, the government's uh, awareness to consider the health and pollution aspect in the, in the development of the working program. We expect that the SPAP uh, can be adopted or, or used as a reference to development of RPGMD regional with the term of uh, development planning. In, uh, uh, as we know that uh, Central Kalimantan will, will have new governor on, on 2021. We also later uh, hope that we, the HPAP result can be incorporated to its uh, related services and agency in the province. In terms of smoke pollution or air pollution, we will have capacity building or training for the government on the data collection uh, for smoke pollution, especially during the forest and peatland fires. We hope that with the, with the capacity building, the government will have better strategy on how to mitigate and uh, how to uh, manage the forest and peatland disaster in the, in, the, in the province. The training itself will be supported by Miami University. Hopefully, uh, with the training, uh, the local, gov local uh, community in Central Kalimantan, Kalimantan have better air quality. The project runs successful, successfully thanks to full support from Oak Foundation, Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, SDC, 
uh, that's all my presentation. Thank you. Terima kasih banyak for your kind attention. I wish you all have a good day. Terima kasih banyak. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Vavia, for a, a very thorough presentation. And uh, thank you also, Budi, for the work that you have put into this. We are now back in the hands of Shazia for uh, questions and answers. We have a few minutes, I think. So um, this has been very interesting and very detailed presentations. We've already been fielding some questions coming on the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom. Um, all the presentations that we have here that we've been able to show will be eventually on Air Quality Asia's website. And I'm sure GAP will share them on theirs as well. So you will be able to get them from there. Um, I would like to actually now recognize the four members of the House of Representatives who have been uh, attending with us this uh, webinar and who are now going to be um, saying a few words as respondents. I will start with Honorable Budi Satrio Jiwandono, who is a member of the House of Representatives of the Republic of Indonesia. Honorable Jiwandono is also Vice Chair of the Commission 4 on Agriculture, Maritime Affairs, Fisheries, Environment, and Forestry. Um, Mr. Jiwandono, you have the floor. Madam President, thank you very much. Um, distinguished and honorable guests, and participants of this webinar. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. And let me say, let me start by just saying it's a pleasure and honor to be here with all of you and to listen to all of the presentations um, presented by uh, the experts. Uh, it's, it's truly uh, an eye opener as well for, for all of us. Um, as uh, Madam President Shazia Rafi mentioned uh, just a moment ago, I, I am a member of uh, Commission 4 and uh, we deal closely with a lot of these the issues that's been presented uh, in the past hour or so. And uh, let me just, uh, I know we have a time constraint, but let me just um, have a, or present a few remarks uh, from the eye of uh, Commission 4, which, which deals with some of these issues. Uh, first of all, um, let me talk about uh, the, the budget, the budget that we have uh, to try to mitigate all these uh, uh, um, issues that affect uh, public health, um, such as environmental degradation, air pollution, water pollution, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I think our budget right now, uh, in terms of the Ministry of Forestry and Environment, is about uh, $500 million uh, annually. That, that's the budget that's been allocated for next year. And 50% of that budget will be allocated in two, uh, two of the biggest uh, director general, and one is for uh, watershed and river basin, as well as forest rehabilitation, and the other is the Director General of Conservation. And um, so I would say I think Indonesia plays a, a major role, of course, in terms of uh, uh, mitigating uh, environmental impact, especially on human health. And have we seen progress? Sure. But do we have rooms of improvement? Yes. Um, uh, I think we have made significant efforts to uh, restore uh, and rehabilitate forest, uh, as we can see from, from the annual budget that's been um, allocated. Um, it's, it's not, of course, it's not uh, perfect yet, but I think slowly but surely it's getting there. I think uh, the international community has al also recognized uh, the performance of the ministry by, by a few months ago. Um, I think uh, the Red Plus program through the Norwegian government has um, uh, awarded uh, some of the uh, funds uh, to, to honor our uh, efforts for uh, reforestation. But let me just say this, um, you know, in terms of uh, public health, uh, we can all see, you know, environmental impacts from uh, agricultural practices, industry, household activities, human he uh, health activities, you know, it's impacting us in a, in a very tremendous way. And, and I think going forward, uh, I think some of you have mentioned, me personally, you know, we would like to see, you know, hopefully um, uh, more education uh, for our general population, more enforcement. I think in terms of regulation, uh, some would argue we have 
uh, a good good and strict regulation, but a lot of it, the problem is about enforcement and law, legal enforcement. Um, we see from uh, the forest fires that's been going uh, almost every other year. Uh, you know, I think this, this COVID-19 pandemic has uh, given us an opportunity to sort of just sit back and think and reset and how we, we want to move forward. Um, and yes, uh, uh, you know, air quality, water quality, soil quality, it's a, it's, 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 it's a huge issue in Indonesia. I myself, I personally, I represent the uh, province of East Kalimantan. And in this province, you know, I see on a daily, on a daily basis how uh, daily human activities, industrial activities, business activities, greatly impact soil, water. And it has a significant uh, impact on the health of uh, our society, you know, uh, young kids, the uh, older uh, generation. It's, 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 it's significant. And I mentioned a few years ago during one of my uh, committee hearings with the Minister of Environment and Forestry regarding air quality. You know, these days we have the technology to monitor air quality on a daily basis, which is, which is incredible for us. You know, hopefully going forward with all this talk of uh, industrial 4.0, you know, we can utilize um, art artificial intelligence, AI, to really model, you know, future climate change um, uh, issues. Uh, you know, uh, use AI to, pre to, to predict, um, uh, model uh, future uh, health pandemics. You know, these are some of the uh, things that we put, we probably need help. I, I mentioned uh, the budget just now, just to show all of you that, yes, um, do we have uh, the, the, the idea, the, 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 the desire to mitigate and to make uh, public health environment better? Yes, we do. Do we have constraints? We have plenty. And I hope with uh, or these kind of uh, talks, these kind of webinars, you know, these kind of collaboration through caucuses, through groups, you know, we can really like, you know, bring up ideas and hopefully uh, all of you, we can help each other, um, whether it'll be government organizations, the private sector, um, you know, with the limited budget that we have and with the big goals that we aspire to, you know, it's, it's, more, it's essential at this point in time for us to be working together. And, and I do hope that AQA will be, will be sort of coordinating us, you know, to go forward. I, and I look forward to uh, be talking to all of you in, in, in the days to come. Thank you, Honorable Jivan Dono. This was a, a very good uh, exposition and also an excellent appeal for all of us to collaborate and work together cross-sectorally. We will definitely do so. I now call on Honorable Sartono Hutomo, um, who is a member also of the House of Representatives and is a member of the Commission 7, which is Energy Research and Technology. So energy and environment are inextricably linked. And he is also a member of the Ethics Committee, a uh, very important uh, part of uh, this debate because uh, part of the ethics that one is trying to encourage is the ethics of honoring uh, the earth and its natural resources. Uh, Honorable uh, Hotomo, you have the floor. Thank you very much for this opportunity, I just a uh, little bit because I think it's already comprehensive. All the, the all the delegates, I just remind that uh, all of us that the strategic objective of the countries of the world are to limit the increase in the global warming to below to decrease Celsius. To achieve that goal, we must process and the basis of the togetherness, but by distinguishing the responsibility and capabilities each mitigation and adaption and works international cooperation is meaningless without concrete assistance regarding financing development countries must do more to reduce this increase in the carbon this mean is that uh, we should be make a target the target is the measurable, uh, reputable, and variable mitigation. It is achieved if we have targets, each we must know 
if we are making progress in achieving this target. This is, I think, is uh, if each country, the development country or developed country uh, focus and each country have a target, a measurable and uh, reportable and variable, I think is uh, the target to degree Celsius is will be happen. I think, thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you, Honorable Um I now give the floor to Honorable Dave Akbar Shah Fikarne, who is um, the member also of the House of Representatives serving in the Commission One, which is a very important commission on defense, foreign relations, communication, information, and intelligence. It also is the commission under which really under foreign policy, all the UN organizations uh, fall. Honorable Ficarno, you have the floor. Right now, what we need to focus and to um, completely uh, dissemination of the information is, is about the dangers of air pollution. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, as this is our job as a parliamentarian that we have to ensure that every single piece of legislation that we produce in the parliament is uh, in in uh, in coherence or in coordinations uh, with our main goal in to reduce the air pol uh, pollution. So, um, although we have to uh, uh, put in considerations of um, the, e the economic uh, sustainabilities and the, our economic goals uh, into reducing poverty, increasing uh, wealth, and then um, uh, making sure that everyone has jobs uh, and and uh, uh, and then the economic uh, uh, wheels are turning. Uh, but uh, in to attain those goals, that we have to put uh, uh, high considerations uh, that um, pollution uh, is 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 also our goal uh, in order to reduce it. So we have to focus into increasing the, the people's wealth we have to we have to focus in, in how to keep the economic going especially in uh, in dire times uh, such as now and where the pandemic is basically changing our course of life uh, but <clears throat> um, every single um, uh, productions uh, all the factories uh, um, oh, it, it ha has to adhere to the government policies of reducing um, the the the, uh, the carbon copies and and um, and all in that uh, uh, and all all in, in all in that directions. So I do hope that um, uh, forum like this uh, we can is is not just a, a a place where we exchange ideas, but it's also a place that we can. Create concrete solutions mm -hmm. uh, that would help the government. That would um, uh, that would uh, we can work together with other parliaments uh, all over the world uh, mm -hmm. in order that we have a, a, a similar uh, platform, yeah? a similar uh, standing uh, <clears throat> that we want to uh, increase the, the economic, but we also want to put uh, the environment first. Yeah. So that's that's the. The message I got uh, from this uh, uh, forum, and then I do hope uh, that this forum will continue on working, and we can have a, a direct communications uh, with other parliamentarians, other government agencies, mm -hmm. uh, and then all of the programs, all of the uh, legislative work, all of the government uh, regulations are made, uh, and, and, and in accordance to our goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and yes, this forum will be an ongoing forum. We've been delayed a bit by COVID. Uh, we normally hold an annual meeting on the sidelines of the World Bank uh, meetings in spring. And in addition, uh, our plans to have an Asia Pacific forum on clean air, linking the work on the west coast of the US with the, the other coast of the Pacific um, has been, of course, now delayed by uh, at least a year. But inshallah, okay. we'll come back. Inshallah, we will we'll, we'll achieve that goal. Yes. There have been several questions submitted through the Q&A given by somebody named Wolfram 
that whether the new government regulations allow a rapid and fundamental restructuring of the Indonesian energy sector towards clean energy where solar and wind power can take precedence. Um, I know that our uh, concluding speaker, Honorable Dia Roro Estividya Putri is uh, an expert in the energy sector and perhaps in her remarks, she will be able to uh, also cover that question. Um, we do have another question uh, from Francis Roy to uh, Honorable Jiwan Dono, I believe. How to balance current conditions with better conditions, namely balancing economic conditions and environmental conditions that are currently in the state of COVID-19. It's a very broad question, Mr. Roy. Um, or Roy. Uh, so I think it would take a very long time to answer this one. Um, Honorable uh, Jivandono, do you think you could make a very quick answer to that one? Um, well, it's a very broad know, question. <laughs> again, it's a, it's a very tough question to answer in a very short period of time. You know, finding that balance between economic development, you know, job creation, and safeguarding environmental uh, uh, and sustainability, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. And, huge challenge. and do, we have, do we have what it takes? Do we have the desire? Do we have the goal? Do we have the ambition to do that? I do believe so. Now, um, all these goals, all these ambition, all these grand ideals, now it's, it's a lot of it is a matter of execution. Um, and a planning execution, that's, that's, I think that's a different, that's, that's a set of, that's a set of skills going forward that we need to uh, enforce ourselves. Um, and I think with public participation and, and more, more, more uh, awareness from the public, you know, we'll be able to find that balance. We'll, we'll be able to find that um, uh, equilibrium uh, going forward. Because right now, I think our country is, it's, it's sort of like finding its, um, its, its equilibrium, you know, which That's one you right. want to put forward first. You know, you want to you want to push forward economic development, GDP growth, but how do you uh, mitigate? How do you include environmental safeguards, sustainability uh, in these models? You know, I think these are these are uh, questions that we all ask ourselves every day on a daily basis uh, when we are when we are uh, doing our duties. But and again, these are all the questions that would take another whole webinar to answer. So exactly, uh, but I, I would I would really stress, you know, hopefully. Uh, through participation, uh, public participation, yes. education, yes. Uh, you know, we can tackle this slowly but surely. Sure, sure. Thank you. Um, I think we are now at the closing and I would like to give the floor to Honorable Dia Roro St. Vidya Putri, uh, who is the Secretary of the Green Economy Caucus, also a member of Commission 7. Um, but what is also uh, I think the case is that the uh, that uh, Honorable uh, S.T. Vidya Putri is probably the youngest uh, member of uh, the House of Representatives, or at least one of the youngest ones. Um, um, prior to becoming a member of the House, of the House, she founded the Indonesian Institute of Energy and Environment. Um, I. E2I in Jakarta, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to address a number of the questions that people have been answering. So, Esti, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Shazia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May peace and blessings be upon you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are uh, right now in the world. Uh, it's, it's an incredible honor uh, for me to be here among such distinguished uh, people. And today, it, you know, we were able to kind of just listen in to a very insightful um, discussion and conversation and presentation where we're, we're, we're able to see um, concrete examples of, of how air pollution is, is currently being tackled at either a national level or, or a province level. And um, I'd like to send my gratitude as well to um, all of the MPs present here today. Uh, let me uh, I guess in a way, introduce a little bit of, uh, about the Green Economy Caucus as this is our commitment um, within the Indonesian parliamentarians right now. As mentioned earlier, we have Ibu Mersi who is the chair of Green Economic Caucus and we have uh, Pasar Tono who is a member of Commission 7. Um, 
uh, Mas Budi Jiwandono, who is, you know, the vice chairman of Commission 4. And we had uh, Pak Dave, uh, Mbak Ratna Juwita, Ibu Dewi Ariani, you know, members of parliament uh, coming from different commissions or committees at the Indonesian parliament. And we are very much committed in, in working together and creating a sustainable future for all. We recognize the importance of collaboration and we are in a situation we, where we have the rights to really just um, not only implement but create policies that are necessary in, in tackling uh, air quality, uh, for example, or, or air pollution as a whole. And um, thank you very much uh, to Ambassador um, Kurt Kunz, uh, Honorable, uh, thank you for the, the insightful remarks and also of, of course from AQA, for Shazia, Harry, and from Pure, or Pure Earth and the Global Alliance and Health and Pollution as well as uh, uh, YTS. And aside from all of that, I'd like to also really just convey, you know, can, given the current pandemic that we are currently faced with, um, we're reminded of the multiple crises that we are, you know, facing today, whether it be in, in the health sector, uh, the economic uh, and also the social sectors, but also uh, bearing in mind the the troubles and, and you know, the crisis that we're currently facing uh, due to climate change, right? And so um, it's, it's kind of reminding us uh, that, you know, the dangers of air pollution is very much alike to the dangers of COVID-19 in a way where this is something that we cannot see um, and, and is, is recognized as a silent killer, right? And so there are uh, many different things that we have to uh, do together in order for us to tackle um, this issue. And as mentioned earlier as well from the other speakers that collaboration is key here. Everybody has a role, um, whether it be we're parliamentarians or we're um, you know, uh, from the executive body, from the government, uh, civil society organi organizations, the youth, everybody um, has, has a role to play. And we have a term called gotong royong in Indonesia, which is really just to collaboratively work together in creating solutions. And this is the kind of mindset that we have to have. And um, aside from that, I'd like to, I guess, answer some of the questions uh, in relation to the energy sector, given that I'm currently a member of Commission 7, which deals with the energy and also the research and technology sectors. Um, we are very, very, very committed in, in um, really just pushing a renewables energy uh, bill. And this is under the pr uh, presumptions that we have several targets, again, pertaining to the COP21 uh, Paris Agreement, uh, we have what's called the nationally determined contributions, and that's been um, translated into a law, uh, law number 16, year 2016, which basically, um, in which Indonesia basically aims to decrease greenhouse gas emissions by 29% and also 41% with international aid. Um, and also aside from that, within the energy sector in itself, we also have a target of achieving 23% um, renewables energy um, by 2025. And of course, uh, in achieving this goal, we are facing several barriers, um, particularly in the executive uh, ex executing side. And just to give a, a kind of like a background to everybody present today, Currently, 9% uh, um, of energy is being run by renewables. Again, remembering that we have a 23% by 2025. So there's so many things that we have to uh, do going forward in order for us to achieve this. Um, one of them is by uh, pushing forward uh, uh, a legislation, particularly in uh, renewable energy, for us to then uh, fulfill the target of 23%. Luckily, um, everybody in Commission 7 are very much committed in realizing this goal. And this has never been done before, just a side note for everybody, um, because discussions have been uh, present uh, before in previous terms, but this never kind of made it to kind of like the uh, the 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 priority list of legislations to be to be um, enacted either for this year or the years to come and so this is um, very new for us in Indonesia but is is something that we're currently uh, working on there are several things that we are uh, discussing uh, in regards to the renewables energy bill whether it be the pricing scheme you know because in a lot of cases. 
uh, renewables always lose against the fossil fuel, right? We know that the fossil fuel industry or fossil fuel generally is, is cheaper in comparison to renewable energy. And so one of the things that we're currently discussing right now is how can we make renewables more competitive within the energy market? We also recognize that Indonesia is, is you know, um, the biggest archipelago in the world. We have so many islands and so many potential uh, when it comes to renewable energy. You know, um, some areas in Indonesia, we can maxim maximize on wind, uh, wind turbines, for example. Other places, um, uh, solar solar panels, you know, the utilization of solar panels. So we recognize that we have so many different potentials and it's uh, about how can we make these um, renewable or alternative energy um, become more competitive. And one of the ways in doing that is maybe um, perhaps enacting um, a carbon pricing scheme, you know, or a carbon tax. And of course, this highly correlates with the level of air quality uh, in which we experience on a daily basis. The more we depend on renewable energy, uh, the better our air quality is going to become, right? Because we're, we're moving away from fossil fuels. And so this is the world that, or the, the, the country that we're trying to create for, for all of us. And with regards to the carbon pricing scheme, uh, this is also important because this takes into account the negative externalities associated to the costs that um, we experience uh, from the fossil fuel industry. So we can make fossil fuels become more expensive in a way by taking into account costs associated to, for example, human health, right? Costs associated to the environment. Uh, and when we uh, kind of add up all of, all of these different costs, it will make uh, renewable energy more competitive uh, within the energy market. So this is something that we're currently working on um, and strategizing on, on whether this would be possible to enact in Indonesia. Um, alongside the government, of course, uh, we're also opening our doors. Uh, Commission 7 is very much open to discussing with experts because we realize that not all of us are experts, right, in this field. So uh, the importance of really just um, talking to the right people and getting the right information for us to then push scientific based policies uh, going forward. And I'm, you know, by the end of all of this, I'm very, very, um, you know, um, proud and also very excited and, and, and very, um, you know, I, I have good, good, a good feeling that we can all work together uh, in creating this, this future for all of us. So these are, I guess, my remarks. Thank you, Shazia, um, for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, I think you are right, uh, putting the cost of the environmental destruction into the cost of the thermal and fossil fuel industry is the way to go. And it's the example that other countries are also following. Um, we would like to now wrap up with a vote of thanks from our treasurer, Honorable Matthew J. Nolan, who also represents AQA on the board of the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution. He is former member of the Irish Parliament, uh, where he was the chief whip um, of uh, the committee, I think, on the budget, um, on finance, um, and also uh, a mem chaired the committee on Com communications, energy, and natural resources. MJ, you have the floor. I think by now it must be like 4.30 a.m. or something in Dublin. 4.20 a.m., yes. 4.20 a.m. <laughs> Um, good day all. Um, excellencies, uh, honourable members of Parliament, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of Air Quality Asia, I want to thank you for your active, passionate and committed engagement in the webinar on the theme uh, Raising Awareness Towards Pollution and Its Impact uh, to Human Health. Climate change accelerated by human activity is firmly recognised as a major global problem and characterized by many as an emergency. Environmental pollution, pollution of air, water, and soil by human activities is the biggest cause of illness and death globally, according to the World Health Organization. Based on our experience in the European Union, concerted action involving national, subnational, and city agencies is required to ensure that regulatory uh, requirements are actually enforced. Along with regulation, urban planning, transportation and infrastructural requirements are key factors typically under the control of cities and states themselves. All of these efforts require the availability 
of adequate human and financial resources. And therefore, an appropriate and regular budget allocation has to be provided. These in turn rely on solid public and political backing for the programme of action. Ladies and gentlemen, establishing an effective administration is a gradual process. Therefore, changes in the regulatory regime in Indonesia must be supported with a multi-annual budget and political backing sustained over a period of time. We hope that this meeting will start that particular process. I, on behalf of Air Quality Asia, want to give a special thanks to the Honourable Mercy Christy Barnans, MP, Indonesia, Chair of the Green Economy uh, Caucus and a board member of Air Quality Asia. Honourable S.T. Winde Puri, MP, Indonesia. Honourable Dr. D. W. Arani, MP, Indonesia, and the distinguished members of the House of Representatives of the Republic of Indonesia. This event would not have been possible without the collaboration of Sustainable World Air Quality Asia and the Global Alliance for Health and Pollution, especially Lucili Okio, and the funding support of the government of Switzerland. And I want to acknowledge the presence and contribution of His Excellency, the Ambassador Kuntz. We also want to thank Ms. Bundy Sicilironi from Pura, Ms. Bovia Win Whitney from YTS for their crucial work on cleaning up pollution as part of um, Kalimantan Health and Pollution Action Plan and to the United Nations Environmental Programme for the important work on monitoring the STGs uh, on uh, pollution. I want to especially thank my colleagues, uh, Harry Deinhoven, Air Quality Asia's focal point for Southeast Asia, and our convener, Shazia Rafi, for their dedicated work in bringing this conference to success. With the able assistance of the AQA GEC team, Dorota Piotrowaska eh, Pelka, eh, Iqbal Appendi, Esther Manulu, eh, Grisa Murati, and Viva Ayer. I thank you all and wish you well. Thank you.